One of the greatest blessings and privileges, and we could say in some ways a duty, that is to be enjoyed by those who are members of the Lord's Church, who are Christians. As far as this life is concerned, is that a prayer. As a child of God, one can, in confession of sins to God, find forgiveness of those sins. John said to Christians in 1 John 1 and verse 9 that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's through prayer the Christian can find peace when those prayers are prayed as the Bible teaches and his full faith in the truth of God's Word as he prays them. Paul said to the brethren at Philippi in Philippians chapter 4 verses 6 through 7, Be careful for nothing, meaning don't be anxious over anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God. Well, what's the outcome of that, Paul? And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It is through prayer that the Christian can receive strength from God. I don't know how all God works on behalf of His children. I know that He communicates with us in His Word. And as we understand His message, we know our duties to Him. And as we discharge those duties, then we are faithful to Him and acceptable to Him. As to what all deity does on our behalf, I mean even right now, who can tell? All I know is, is that heaven and all that pertains to heaven is on the side of God's children. And that's a comforting thought. And I learned that from the Word of God itself. So we must be mindful of God being for us. As Paul said, if God's for us, who can be against us? Sometimes I think we think God's against us, but He's not. He's for us. God would have all men be saved. But of course, in order to be saved from your alien sins, one must hear and believe the gospel and meet its terms of pardon in obedience to the gospel of Christ and being baptized for the remission of sins. And therein the Lord adds us to the church. In Ephesians 1, 3, we know that all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. And we must be, as believers in Christ, repenting of our sins and confessing our faith in Christ, be baptized into Christ to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins. Galatians 3, 27 and Acts 2, verse 38. Thereby the Lord adds us to the church where He's located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Acts 2, 47 and again Ephesians 1, 3. Well, one of those great privileges, as I said at the beginning, is the right as children of God to pray to God, to offer our petitions to Him, to know that He will answer our prayers. And for all of that, Paul frequently exhorted Christians to be diligent in their prayers. Listen to him in Ephesians 6 and verse 18. And this is after he lists uh, the spiritual armor that we are to put on. He ends it by talking about prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplications. To the Colossians in chapter 4 and verse 2 he said, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. The idea is that prayer should be characteristic all day long every day of the faithful life of a Christian. We're on speaking terms with God once we become His children. And we ought to want to speak with the God of all glory and the judge of all the earth through the only mediator between God and man Jesus Christ. It's available to us. And we should exercise it. We should desire to. Jesus knew that people would tend to become slack in their prayers to God. He said in Luke 18 in verse 1, And He spake a parable unto them 
to this end. This is the point he wanted to get across. That men ought always to pray and not faint or cease to be what they ought to be. Prayer is an integral part of being faithful. I don't know how a person can be faithful and not adhere to the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament concerning our privilege and obligation to pray to Him. It's not just some sort of psychological effort that helps us pull out uh, sins and weaknesses in our lives and our anxieties and because we pull them out and state them to ourselves then we're, we feel better like we've gone to a psychologist or psychiatrist and had an hour on the couch talking about everything that bothers us. God does not picture prayer in that way. It's actually speaking to our Father in heaven and He's promised I will answer those prayers. Of course we are to answer according to His will which will is set out in the New Testament. So it's out of a similar concern that we should study the Bible to learn about prayer. That is the same concern that Jesus had that men ought always to pray and not faint. And it's out of that concern that such a lesson as this is developed and preached as the word is preached on this subject. We have so much available to us to help us walk the straight and narrow way and not turn to the left hand or the right. And surely when we know what the Bible teaches on prayer, the importance of prayer, that we will be a praying people. Can you imagine Christians not being a praying people? It just doesn't sound right to say that those who are of Christ are not a praying people. Today I want to talk about there are a number, in other words, aspects of prayer the Bible teaches that we need to know. But today I want us to concern ourselves with the characteristics set out in the Scriptures of acceptable prayer. Well, acceptable to whom? Well, we're praying to the Father. And so we're talking about prayers that His children pray to Him so that they will be acceptable to Him, so that um, they will be heard by Him. First of all, our prayers must be offered in faith. Now we know that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Our belief, our trust in God is based on what the Bible tells us. It's ridiculous to say that I have faith in God that He will do thus and so or not do thus and so when the Bible hasn't said a thing about it one way or the other. You can't have faith in God on any other foundation than the foundation of truth stated in the Bible or else Romans 10 17 makes no sense whatsoever. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In Matthew 21, 22, And all things, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. I think right there, a lot of Christians need a lot of help. The Lord promised that. If we can't believe that, how is it we can believe Him when He says to the person who's a believer in Christ, who's repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ, that when you're immersed in water by the authority of Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to obtain the remission of sins, since all sins against God, then God does, must do the forgiving. How do you know He forgave you if He's not true to His promise to do so when from the heart you do what you're supposed to do? Well, what does He say concerning the Christian's duty and privilege to pray to Him? And all things, whatever you ask in prayer, believing, ye will receive. We must then have faith in God and His ability to answer our prayers. If you look in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, He makes it clear in all things in coming to God, but without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is rewarder of them that seek after him. If, if we don't have that, when we come before God in prayer, our prayers will not be heard. They will certainly not be answered. James deals with this when he makes application, really, of Hebrews 11, 6, and Romans 10, 17, to the conduct of people in the church, our brethren. He says, if any of you lack wisdom in understanding what he's been talking about there. Let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. 
That doesn't rule out your obligation to study and to understand the truth and how to ascertain the New Testament authority for your life. But it also means it's to be accompanied by prayer. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Now note that, nothing wavering. There can't be any doubts. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, which with the wind, uh, driven with the wind and tossed. Now watch. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And then he says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Again, that's James 1, 5 through 8. The importance of prayer, or rather of faith, in our prayers, as we pray our prayers, as we engage in prayers we ought to, as our thoughts are connected to the words we utter in prayer, it all must be according to the will of heaven, or else how else can you walk by faith? Can you imagine someone saying, well, I prayed to God all I could, but I didn't pay a bit of attention to His will as to how I should pray or what I should pray for. Well, that certainly couldn't be in faith, since faith comes from hearing the Word of God. So the question is that we need to ask ourselves relative to anything in our service to God, but since our topic is faith and acceptable prayer, is our faith weak? Well, we need to increase it, and the only way it can be increased is by the knowledge of the Word of God. Now that brings us down to this. Probably two of the most neglected things among those who name the name of Christ, who wear the name Christian, and, and look to God through Christ by the gospel to be saved, is the lack of time we spend in real, genuine Bible study and the lack of time we spend in prayer. In other words, the lack of time we spend in listening to God talk to us and tell us what to do and then the lack of time we spend in praying to God and letting Him know what our needs are. Isn't that amazing? You know, if you can stop that in your life, Satan have to do anything else. If he can stop you from praying to God, if he can stop you from studying your Bible, you're leaving wide open yourself for Satan to use you. And that's what God is indicating. And you study what the Bible says about Bible study and then prayers we're studying now. He knows. He's reading the comments about that. Men, Christ said, ought to pray and not give up or faint. It must be offered in the spirit of humility. You know, we don't live in a very humble age. And somebody might say, well, whenever has in the world's history people in general been humble? Well, that's true. When you think about what the Bible teaches a person to be, one of the first things it's going to teach you is to be humble, is to admit your faults and your mistakes, is to be teachable, and to change your life to fit the truth that God sets out. Consider, and I know we've read this before, but it seems so appropriate in this study right now, what the Lord said in Luke 18, uh, starting with verse 9, and we'll go through verse 14. And you'll remember this is where he contrasts the publican and the Pharisee. Beginning in verse number 9 of chapter 18, he says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. Now stop right there. Who is he speaking to? Certain people. What certain people? Those that trusted in themselves. In what sense did they trust in themselves? That they were righteous. And what did this view of righteousness that they held cause them to think about other people? And despise others. Now that's not pride. I don't know how to define it. Now watch. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Now you know that the Pharisees looked down on the publicans. Well, they despised them. Because they were Jews taking up taxes for Rome and taking up more than Rome needed so they could take the extra and use it for themselves. And being Jews, that just made it that much worse. Now watch, verse 11. The Pharisees stood and prayed thus with themselves. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as is publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. 
And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, what did Jesus Christ, who's our only mediator between God and man, who died for us, suffering in that death terribly, and who now in our future is going to be our judge? What did he say about this? I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You just can't approach God reminding Him how good you are and how much better it is to have you than other folks and you wish they'd measure up where you are. Well, if there's anything that comes across here, God changes channels. Or He turns the whole thing off when you start that. What is there in any of our lives, no matter how much Bible we know and how close we live to it, that should cause us in approaching God in prayer to boast about our lives. What is there? It's certainly not humility that causes that. If there's anything that should be on our minds when we approach God in prayer, is what we need to correct. Is what we need to be bolstered up in in the faith. How strong we need to be and how much stronger we want to be. We're not worthy to become before, come before God in the sense of saying, I, I'm, I'm fine. Just wish other folks were as good as I am. Now, if that's not the point he's making here, what words with what meanings would he have to write them in the book that you read and apply to your life to say such a thing? I don't know what it would be. I know I don't see anything in the Bible teaching prayer as far as the attitude of the one praying that doesn't indicate humility and meekness and a and a reflection upon our own lives that we could be far better than what we are to the greatest. You say, well, how do you know that? Read what Paul has to say about himself. And wouldn't you like to have the love of God and faith of Paul the Apostle? Well, I would, but he never felt that way about it. He always saw room for growth and development. Or he wouldn't have said putting away those things that are forgetting those things that are behind. I press onward. For the mark, the prize, the high calling. I have not yet attained. But that one thing he did. So humility is there. Always will be when we as humans in this world look at ourselves and then compare ourselves with Jesus. Remember, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. Psalm 34 and verse 18. As James said, God resists the proud, but give us grace. Now, what is that? He gives favor to the humble, James 4 and verse 6. Our prayers must be offered in harmony with God's will. Those are only prayers God's going to answer, 1 John 5 and verse 14. Jesus provided the pattern or the example for us in His prayers in Gethsemane. You remember Luke 22, verse 42? He wanted to escape the ordeals of the crucifixion. Any normal human being would. Yet he had such control over himself that after praying to God that such would happen, he always said, not my will, but thine be done. That must be characteristic of all of our prayers. Not my will, but thine be done. Have you ever prayed for certain things to transpire? This person get over a sickness or this happen in somebody else's life and in your mind it's all with the right attitude and for good? Yes. But have you ended the prayer because God knows all that's knowable, thus He knows what you don't know. He has His designs all worked out and have you then ended your prayer with not my will but thine be done? acquiescing to he who knows all things and has all power and has all under his control. And I'd say that we certainly are not in that position. Too often prayers are unanswered because they are more concerned with our will rather than God's will being done. James knew that in writing to Christians. He said, ye ask and receive not. Well, let's stop right there for a moment. Didn't God say he would answer? 
Our prayers, yes. Well, they asked. They didn't receive anything. Wonder where the problem is, with God or with them? Well, listen. They didn't receive because you ask amiss. You're not asking according to the will of God as Christians ought to. And he says what it is. You're praying to receive things that you may consume it up on your lusts. Well, now, lust can only be lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Now, we often think, well, they're wanting to engage in things immoral, and they're asking God to give them things so they can do it. That's not what that says. Lust are the appetites of the flesh. All those appetites, none of them, are sinful in themselves. But they do pertain to the body and the flesh and the desires of this life. So these folks were asking and asking and asking for things from God, but what did they pertain to? Things that would make them enjoy their life in the flesh and quench the appetites of their flesh. I mean, it was sinful. It just means they focus wrongly as those who are of Christ. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, why that ye may consume whatever the blessing would be upon your lust. James 4.3 then our prayers must be offered by those who are righteous before God. Peter declares in 1 Peter 3 and verse 2, and remember he wrote to Christians, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. Watch. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Well, what's evil? Evil is anything not authorized by the Bible or we engage in that which is forbidden. And you say, well, I, I never thought of evil that way. Well, you ought to. <laughs> it's the only way to view evil. How do I know what's sinful, what's evil, what's wicked? Didn't suit me? No. It's that which is contrary to the will of Jesus Christ. And so his eyes are open to those and his ears hear those who are faithful to the Lord who are keeping His commandments, and who operate accordingly. But I learn also from James 5, 16 through 18, that the prayers of the righteous are very effective. More so probably anybody realizes. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. I wish we believed that. Let me ask something of you, and you answer it in your own mind. Those who have been members of the church as long as anybody in this audience have, have you ever seen the church come together just to pray? We come together for singing, for the study of the Bible. Have you ever seen the Lord's people on this earth come together to simply unite in prayer? I wonder why. I wonder what that says about us. And yet it's been all around the country in the Lord's church. I don't know why that's not the case. But we don't do it. I think to a great extent we're creatures of tradition. And because we haven't done it all along, we don't do it. But that's no reason not to. I wonder if all of us unite to pray for this country. I think it will make any difference at all. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So wonder where some of our problems are. Listen to what is said in Proverbs 28 and verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. I wonder how many people have prayed abominations when they thought they were praying to be heard of God and he would receive their prayer and bless them. And why? Because they won't do God's will. It is a fruitless thing to think that I can disobey what I know God expects me to do or commit any sin and know it's sin and then pray to God as if there is no sin even though I know I need to correct it and what to do to correct it but I won't and still think He's going to hear me. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Well, then where's the problem? But your iniquity has separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. Again, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. 
To be righteous before God requires that we submit to the righteousness that is of God and offered to us in the gospel system, Romans 10, 1 through 4. Thus we must respond to the gospel of Christ to become a Christian and enjoy all these spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ by being baptized into Christ for the rest of sins. And then live as the New Testament says Christians are to live, and that governs everything in the New Testament pertaining to our prayers. Prayer is something that we need to study as much as we need to study how to deliver sermons. It's always been interesting to me that we could have whole courses in preacher schools and other places teaching about homiletics. That is, the speaking of God's will, how to prepare a sermon. We emphasize the importance of Bible study, but in the study of that Word of God as, what, as to what pertains to righteous living, then so much is said about prayer. And I wonder if we've ever taught people how to pray. You know, the disciples of Christ came and said to Christ, John's teaching his disciples how to pray, teach us to pray. And thus we get the wonderful model that Jesus gave, gave us of prayer. But how much time do we spend on it in our homes, in our individual studies, and even in church? Oh, Lord, teach us to pray. Our prayers must be offered with a spirit of thanksgiving. In Ephesians 5.20, Paul said, Giving thanks always for all things to God. Again, in the Philippian letter, in chapter 4 and verse 6, he wrote, In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. In uh, the Colossian letter, chapter 4 and verse 2, he talks about prayer and being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 through 18, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Now, let me ask you, do you ever go through a day and never as a child of God and his family thank God? You say, well, yeah, I did when we had, a, we had a meal. Was that the only time? No, I'm not saying that's to make light of it, but is that the only time? And do we even do that then? We're usually too busy. Can you imagine a child of God too busy to pray to his father? Do we think God will help us with our present <coughs> burdens if we don't take the time to thank him for past blessings our prayers to be received of God to be answered by God must be offered with persistence persistence I think you'll notice that Jesus well set out this aspect of prayer in Luke chapter 11 verses 5 through 10 there our Lord said as Luke records by inspiration and he said unto them which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine and his journeys come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Sometimes we quote verse 10 and, well, so. We don't realize the context which is found. It's the idea of persistence. The Greek verbs in verse 10, the asking part of them, the seeking and the knocking are all in the Greek present tense. That means linear action. You never stop. You don't just go up and say, hey, I need this right now. Will you help me? No, I won't. Okay, I'm gone. The idea is you never, never, never stop asking. You never stop seeking. And you never stop knocking. You're persistent and you're steadfast. You see, that shows God your faith in Him to do it. So many times we just pray, Oh, Father, help me be a better Christian. 
Well, I'm not opposed to those prayers, but if you think that's all it takes in prayer, then you miss the import of why this is even in your Bible and what you ought to learn from it. It's persistence. Never give up doing what you know is right. Now notice the desire is a right desire. Thus, our desires must be in harmony with God's will when we pray to God. So persistence. Pray as if everything depended on you. And then stay after it. Never quit. Be persistent. Because that's how you find out that it gets God to do what you want. Now, that's a sad way of putting it for some people. I don't know the way to say it. That's the whole point here. Why do, you, why do you approach God and ask Him to do something? You're only going to get Him to do what He wants, what you want. So the parable is one that is given to teach us something. Now, what does it teach us? But that's not the only one. Look in Luke 18. You get the same thing again. This is about uh, the widow who was very persistent. Beginning in verse 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end. There's a point to it. That men ought always to pray and not to faint. Okay, why are you giving us this parable, Lord? So you won't quit praying? That you'll pray always and you won't quit? saying, There was in the city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? If you couple these with what James says in correcting the brethren he wrote to 2,000 years ago to get them to know how to pray, then you see that God expects persistent, steadfast praying in harmony with His will with full belief that He will answer those prayers. If not, I don't know what these words are saying. I don't know what they teach me. I don't know what to try to do about my own life when it comes to prayer. No, the message is here. And He tells us it's to this very end that I'm offering this parable. The virtue of persistence is demonstrated in the prayers of Jesus in Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 44. Paul's realization of things when it came to his three times praying that the thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, would be removed, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 8. You say, well, he didn't get it removed. And thus he didn't get the answer to his prayer. Somebody doesn't know what they read when they read that. Jesus appeared to him and said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Now, what does that tell Paul regarding what he considered to be an irritation or a thorn in the flesh, whatever it was? It says it's taken care of. How does he say it's taken care of? My favor in the gospel will consider all that and take it into consideration, and it, you don't have to worry about it anymore. If that's not what he's saying, again, I ask you, what would he have to say to say it? My grace is sufficient for thee. Paul knew in his mind, at least he thought, this is something handicapping my work for the Lord. So he prays earnestly three times. He gets an answer, doesn't he? It's Jesus that speaks to him. If that's not an answer, I don't know what it is. And he says, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, let me think about that a minute. Who is strong in the kingdom? The one that realizes he's weak and operates accordingly. So sometimes maybe these things that come upon us that are a bitter pill to swallow will keep us at the state of mind that we need to be humble and approachable and mindful of spiritual things that otherwise we might not. If that's not a message there that's in harmony with the totality of the scriptures on how we're kept by God, I don't know what it is. When you look at the early church continuing in prayer in Acts 2.42, 
Take all that we've seen here and realize the importance of it. You know, when our parents loved us and kept us back from doing something, you ever remember just being so upset? They won't let me. I can't do this. And then a lot of times you're unfair. I wish you had better parents than this. Don't know what, blah, blah, blah. And stupidity flows out of the mouth of children when that happens. But if parents are doing on the basis of their knowledge and wisdom and love of you and their responsibility to discipline you and bring you up the nurture and admonition of the Lord, maybe someday you'll grow up to have enough sense to see why they said no when you wanted to hear yes. And those of us who have made it to where we are today can remember those things from our parents that said no when we thought it ought to be yes. Well, how much more so does God, our Heavenly Father, and all that means to be God, when He says no, it's for our best. We just trusted Him according to His Word. The last point, it must be offered in the name of Jesus. Now, that doesn't just mean in the name of Jesus. It means that I know I'm approaching God by the authority of the only mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, His Son, my Savior, in accordance with His will. In Ephesians 5.20, Paul said to us, Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we're saying in Jesus' name, we know in our minds it's by His authority we're coming before your throne. Remember Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way to God. And thus when we say in Jesus' name, then we're saying we're coming to God through the only avenue there is to Him. This means much more then than simply just adding that little thing. We ought to know what we're saying when we say it. When we say in Christ's name, amen. We must realize that Jesus is the only way, John 14, 6. And he is our high priest. I don't think we understand a whole lot about priests and system of worship that required us to go through those God had designated as priests who had the right and the authority to offer up whatever we bring to God because we in the church are priests, each one of us going through our high priest to God who is the way. But consider what is said to Christians in Hebrews chapter 7 verses 24 and 25. The inspired writer said, but this man, this is speaking of Christ, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's a wonderful thought. Wonder why we don't employ that more in our lives as we pray consider what was said earlier in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16 and there the same writer had this to say seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens Jesus the Son of God let us hold fast our profession for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Well, what's the point of that? Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And yet we find it so hard to work prayer in a busy schedule. Something doesn't sound right. And thus we need to do some strong reviewing of our own lives to see whether we really are as faithful sometimes as we think we are. We'll be stronger when we engage in prayer according to the Lord's will. And that involves every one of the principles we studied today as to our prayers being acceptable to Him and our being answered of Him, which will always work to our spiritual growth and development. If you're not a child of God, we studied in the sermon what a man must do to be saved to become a Christian. As a child of God, we recognize even in prayer, we confess our sins to God and pray for His forgiveness. That's God's second law of pardon. For those who have committed sins publicly and brought reproach upon the church, there's a need to take care of those sins as publicly as they were committed and to come confessing those sins and praying God for forgiveness. If, therefore, you are truly subject to the call of Christ to become a Christian, 
or to be restored to your first love, we invite you to come to him while we stand and sing. <laughs>